morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the campus of SCE and for the School of Theology on behalf of the Black Seminarians Association and the opening of the Preaching Empowerment Series. If you will, open up your programs and we'll begin to call our church. Stony the world, we daily try. Living in chaos and political tension, we daily see injustice, depravity, and toxic individualism among the community. We daily struggle to see <coughs> a way through all <coughs> incivility and inclusivity. Together. God, God of glory, we know you are our Lord and our Savior, making ways out of your way in every day. We come today seeking a just peace. We come today seeking liberation. We come today to worship our God together. Amen. Here at 
Perkins School of Theology for the honor of coming to share with you uh, during what promises to be a powerful weekend. You have some uh, amazing prophetic voices that I feel will uh, challenge and uh, speak a word for such a time as this. Uh, Dr. Gina Stewart, yes. uh, as far as I'm concerned, is the greatest preacher walking the planet today. Yeah. And so if you have never heard her, do not die. Dr. Michael Waters is a phenom, and of course, mm -hmm. uh, Zan Weston Holmes Jr. is an icon and legend yeah. of prophetic witness. And so I'm appreciative uh, for this opportunity to get up and get out of their way uh, so that you can be blessed uh, by their uh, profound prophetic witness. Uh, I want to call your attention to a passage of scripture found in the uh, book of Ephesians. I love your theme, and so Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 11, uh, lets us know this was, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 11. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who were called the circumcision a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace in his flesh. He has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us, preaching Jesus in an un just world. One of the early homiletical influences of the drum major for justice, Martin Luther King Jr., was the incomparable Dr. William Holmes Borders, who pastored Wheat Street Baptist Church there on Sweet Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, right down the street from Ebenezer Church, where Martin King was growing up. Dr. William Holmes Borders, in his wonderful book entitled The Handyman of the Lord, tells an instructive and insightful story that speaks to us even today. This was during a time when the depression had hit, and yet there were some who were blessed by way of their financial wealth and prosperity. And there was one African American who was struggling. He had been in prison, as it were, by impoverishment. And he made his way to the home, the mansion of this wealthy southerner. He makes his way to the mansion of this wealthy sub the sub southerner and knocks on the front door, hoping that the southerner knowing that this is a tough time for many, but not for him, will have a heart of compassion and give lovingly to this one who was struggling, especially under the economic, uh, under the economic strength and weight of the Great Depression. Check out what happened. The young African American knocks on the door and opening the door is the wealthy owner of this mansion. The wealthy owner of the mansion says, how may I help you? He says, I'm hoping that you will allow me to get just a morsel of food to feed myself and to feed my family. He said, okay, here's what you do. Go around to the back door and I'll be happy to give you some food. The African American man makes his way around to the back door and the wealthy owner of the mansion opens up the door and then says to him before I give you this food we must say grace now repeat after me these words our father and the black man responds your father of course that upset the wealthy owner who was trying to give him food and he said no you are to repeat after me when I pray say what I say because we are asking God's blessings upon this food now say it after me our father the black man said your father why won't you say our father he says because if I say our father it implies that we are brothers and if we are brothers I know our heavenly father would not like you treating one of his children in a backdoor fashion in a real sense my sisters and brothers you understand that on one level the black man had such a strong sense of divinity informing his own 
humanity that he refused to allow anyone else to dehumanize him. On the other hand, are we not ashamed of that wealthy southern, southern landowner who in a real sense had a toxic theology that in a real sense resulted in a sick sociology that was informed by an infected ideology. Yes, my sisters and brothers, I'm suggesting that this is an unjust world. That is what's going on in the time of our text. There are arguments that we won't settle today over who is the author of the book of Ephesians. Tradition <laughs> says the gospel globe trotter and trailblazer theologian from Tarsus, the articulate African apostle Paul, but still others say no, it can't be Paul because the phraseology that does not remind them of language that was used by Paul in other settings. I won't have that argument with you in this setting. I will simply say whoever wrote it, according to the wonderful womanist scholar Mitzi Smith, is writing and utilizing, here it is, the metaphor, no, not the metaphor, but the model. There it is of a legal document. Yeah. A legal document that is being used to merge two corporate entities. One corporate entity, according to Mitzi Smith, is domestic, and the other corporate entity is foreign. And so you have a foreign and domestic entity, entities that are coming together in a corporate merger, according to Mitzi Smith. You missed your shout because <laughs> you understand what Missy is declaring is that the Gentiles who had been seen as second class citizens are being brought together in the name of Jesus to become first class citizens with who those who have a Jewish history, a Jewish background, their Jewish background had caused them to believe that somehow they were supreme, that they were superior to those who were Gentile Christians. Can you imagine that? In the body of Christ, there were first and second class citizens. Can you imagine that? There were those who were using the name of Jesus in order to reinforce second class citizenship and segregation. But look what the book says. The writer of this emancipating epistle, this matchless and marvelous missive known as Ephesians writes the people of God and says to them, in Jesus Christ, the wall of hostility has been torn down. Yeah, now, yeah, I love yeah, how this, uh, this pericope begins. It begins with what? The wonderful conjunction, therefore. I like that because that means you have to read what is before therefore so you can understand what the therefore is therefore. And before <laughs> therefore, you discover that chapter one begins amazing with, with the writer sharing with us that we all now in Jesus Christ have access to every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. That's hot right there because it lets all of us know when you get to know Jesus, it's not just about taking your soul to heaven after you die. It's about God every now and then unleashing the power of heaven in your earth on earth before you die. That's why the old school hymn writer a rope, come ye disconsolate, where'er ye languish, come to the mercy seat, fervently kneel. Here, bring your wounded hearts. Here, tell your anguish. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. I love that, but he goes on from there to talk about the fact as people of faith, we have access to the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I love that right there. It simply lets you know that whatever you're up against, going through, dealing with, God testifies from heaven through Jesus Christ. If I can handle a three-day dead Jesus, I can handle whatever situation you find yourself in. Yeah, you're still missing the shout. I'll go ahead and move from there because now in chapter 2, the Bible lets us know it excites me with energy. With, with energy. Why? Because the writer says that we once were dead in our sins and trespasses, but in God, through Jesus, Jesus 
Christ, grace has turned our mess into a masterpiece. And now we come to verse 11 where the writer, the wise writer is letting all of us know that there is a gospel, there is a Jesus that we ought to be preaching in the midst of the injustice of this world. You will agree with me, this is a word for such a time as this. How sad is this world in which we live? We just came through a midterm election that has re reflected the broken politics of uh, these disunited states of America. Those of us whose skin has been kissed by nature's son, we immediately say, sadly, we may be disappointed, but we're not shocked because America has never kept it 100 about its own sordid and sick and sinful past, especially as it relates to the birth of this nation. I think that's why some say when you look at the founding of this country, there's a birth defect that has never been healed. And that's why it's essential that we keep we quit lying to ourselves. And when we witness the terror that takes place in places like Pittsburgh, in a synagogue, in places like Thousand Oaks, just early this morning, in the wee hours of this morning, and politicians get up to appease the American arrogance by saying that this is not American. You are lying because America was born in terror. America was born dehumanizing certain individuals because of how God created them. And until you get real about what happened, you won't get healed from what is happening. Great for the did. My sisters and brothers, I'm saying it's essential that we heed the call of the black seminarians this weekend who are challenging us to preach Jesus in this unjust world. It's an unjust world. As a matter of fact, Dr. Cornell West throws down like this. We're experiencing the eclipse of decency, honesty, and integrity, leaving us in the chaotic shadows of emboldened racism, predatory patriarchy, ugly xenophobia, unvarnished greed, yep. not to mention my sisters and brothers, a, a military madness. That is the world in which we find ourselves. What is wrong? What is it that has made this nation so sick? Again, it goes back to how we were originally constituted. I'll see if I can help you. Dr. Jeremiah Wright Jr. is my mentor. That one, yeah. The one you just thought about. And Dr. Jeremiah Wright is brilliant insightful when he says if you bake a cake and then take that cake out of the oven and then it hits you oops I forgot to put sugar in the recipe what are you going to do are you going to pour sugar on top of the cake no why because the cake has been wrongly constituted and because it has been wrongly constituted you can't pour something on top of what's wrongly constituted you have to rebake the cake because the structure is not right. The structure is wrong. And I am here to say, in this unjust world, we cannot content ourselves with kumbaya individual moments of love and feeling good about one another because of a friend that we have who does not look like us. No, we've got to deal with a structure in this country that is reflective of a country that has been wrongly constituted. And that is why the writer of Ephesians says in Jesus Christ, here's your shout right here, the dividing wall of hostility, the structure has been torn down because the structure has been torn down. The good news is we can all live in the fulfillment of human possibility. What is our Lord saying to us? I love it. It's saying these things and I'm done. Number one, it says to all of us, and I say it again, I guess I'm quoting who is it? James Baldwin. James Baldwin says, and I, when I remix him this way, you cannot fix what you will not face. I love what's happening in this text because listen to what the writer says. He says, you who were uncircumcised. Now, Bible readers already 
know, and you scholars here at Perkins, I'm not telling you anything brand new. It was there, it was what? The biblical N word. Yeah. It was a word that was derogatory. Yeah. To call someone the uncircumcised was to label them. And we know why we label people. We label in order to limit. We profile in order to persecute. And so when they referred, when they were referred to as the uncircumcised, it was a reflection of a determination to label in order to limit. But look how it is phrased now. It says you who were. That's past tense. Meaning yeah. that in Jesus Christ what is behind you no longer defines you so it cannot confine you. I just pray to y'all miss the shout right there. I'm simply trying to say that in Jesus Christ labels come down. In Jesus Christ you cannot limit me with your own toxic masculinity because in your toxic masculinity you have the nerve to believe that you can invade the space of women ignore their voices and render them invisible because your toxic masculinity in a real sense is guilty of what Dr. Eddie Glaw Jr. talks about when he says in America there is not just an achievement gap and a wealth gap but there is a value gap. Come on. What is that value gap? That value gap says that there are some in this country who are valued more than other sisters. I don't know why you're sitting on me. I'm trying to help you right now because the bottom line is women are valued less than men in this country and there's something sick and sinful about that. Women still not shouting with me so I help you my sisters. But if you talk about the black sisters and in this nation you make 70 cents on the dollar to men and yet when you go to pay your bills you don't get a 30% discount. Why? Because we live in a country that has a value gap where some are valued more than others and with that being the case listen to what this text says. This text says in Jesus the value gap is obliterated. Come on. In Jesus the value gap has been bridged and as a consequence red, yellow, brown, black and white, male, female, however you self-identify you are precious in the sight of almighty God. Because God says I obliterate the value gap. I like that right there. Black people. I don't know why y'all not feeling this where there is a value gap. Yeah, Have yeah, you thought yeah. about the fact and Glaw goes down like this that John Adams in conversation at the beginning of the founding of this nation when the colonies were still in existence was in conversation with the king of England and the king of England was telling John Adams what they were going to do. Adams responded we're not going to allow you to treat us like Negroes. What was he saying? That we are valuing some more than others and it still exists to this day. Why? Because it's manifest in our nation's response to what the opioid crisis. Have you not been blown away by the response to the opioid crisis? The opioid crisis. How have we responded? We have said this is a public health crisis and that's what it should be because addictions need treatment. But what happened in the 80s and 90s when crack cocaine flooded the communities of those whose skin has been kissed by nature's son. I'll tell you what Tupac said. Tupac threw it down like this. Instead of a war on poverty, they have a war on drugs so the police can bother me. Y'all still did get it. I'll give it to you. Like the girl Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill throws down like this. Black rage is founded on blatant denial. Squeezed economic subsistence survival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deafening silence. Social control. Black rage is founded on wounds on the sword because there is a, a, a there is a value gap in this country and in the name of Jesus Christ it's time now for us to rise up yeah. and declare the value gap is obliterated yeah, yeah. and the value gap must now be the, the value gap must be obliterated in the structures and systems of this nation. Yes sir, yes sir. Well, I guess I'll tell yeah. you like this. It's so powerful because he goes on to say, I love this, in Jesus Christ, 
we can upgrade it. Hey. Uh, hey. Uh, Jesus says, let me upgrade you. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just go on and do it. Come on. Come on. Those of you who follow Beyonce know that Beyonce talks in love language about let me upgrade you. Yeah, yeah. That's why I love for Beyonce to upgrade me, but, but nobody can upgrade you like Jesus Christ. Yeah. Jesus Christ comes into your life. Yeah. Jesus offers the best upgrade. I like that Jesus offers that upgrade. How is it done? The text lets us know our Lord was lynched on a cross. And when he was lynched on a cross, it tore down that dividing wall and unleashed a movement that obliterated the value gap. I love that right there. The Lord was lynched on a cross and his lynching tore down that wall. I guess I'm trying to say this is an exciting day. Even though our hearts are broken by tragedy from Thousand Oaks to Pittsburgh and even right here in Dallas, Texas when people of faith already are ready to shout because our God has a track record hey. of transforming tragic murders into transformational movements. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Our Lord can take a tragic murder and transform it into a transformational movement. I think of it history and I not because we understand that December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks boards a bus there in Montgomery, Alabama, takes her seat, refuses to give up that seat. Why? Because according to the wonderful work, the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, she was thinking at that moment about Emmett Till right. and the courage of his mother because his mother, August 28th, 1955, had decided when she received the bloated, broken body of her son that she was not going to have a closed casket but an open casket funeral to make America face up to the hypocrisy in its practice of democracy. And I love what happened because according to Rosa Parks, she stayed seated and took a stand and when she stayed seated, you know what happened. It unleashed a movement so a tragic murder resulted in a transformational movement. You still didn't shout. I move it Further because it was June of 1963 yeah. that Medgar Evers was shot That's and right. killed yeah. there in yeah. Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. And when he got shot and killed the next day, John Kennedy comes on television and announces he's going to seek passage of civil rights legislation. Yeah. But then later that year, September 15th, oh, four no. girls oh, in whoa. Birmingham oh, are no. killed in 16th Street Baptist Church as a bomb goes off. And then later Later that year, November 22nd, right here in Dallas, Kennedy is killed by an assassin's bullet. Yeah. All of those are tragic murders, but a southerner by the name of Lyndon Baines Johnson yeah. made it hit for his political mission to pass civil rights legislation. And in 64, the legislation was passed, but you got to go back to those tragic teach, murders teach, teach, that teach, produced teach. the transformational movement. Y'all still missing your shout. Let, let me take the Freedom Summer 1964 because there you have Schwerner, Goodman, and Shaney. They come down from the north and there two whites and one black go to Mississippi and you know what happened. They got killed during Freedom Summer but fast forward to February 26, 1965 and there you see Deacon Jimmy Lee Jackson shot and killed while marching for voters' rights. Where? In, in Selma, Alabama. Mm. And they marched from Selma through Bloody Sunday all the way to Montgomery. And that's when we had the beginning of what? The Voting Rights Act. Yeah. Because those yeah. tragic yeah. murders yeah. led to a transformational yeah. movement. Martin yeah. King was killed April 4th, 1968. And at that moment, that's when Johnson came mm -hmm. and passed, what was it? Housing yeah. legislation. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because a tragic murder became a transformational movement. Yeah. I got one more tragic murder. Oh, it occurred one Friday on a hill far away. And the book lets us know that tragic murder produced a transformational movement. And so, my sisters and brothers, Jesus upgrades us. But finally, the text lets us know that what Jesus did back then creates a vision of what we ought to be right now. I like that right there. It's a vision of what we ought to be. It's right there in verse 14. 
14 if you haven't shouted yet. Verse 14 gets me hyped. But he is our peace. Yeah. In his flesh he has made both one uh, groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility that is between us. I wish this passage was read yesterday at the press conference yeah. at the White House Come on. because there is a hostility coming from the White House that has declared war on the press and war on people that do not agree with him in the United States of America. But what we ought to do is catch a vision of what God has done in Christ in the past and make that our sense of possibility yeah. in our present. Yeah. 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 say what God has done back then, God wants us to live out right now. And when we live it out right now, then love will replace hate and peace will replace confusion. And all of God's children will be able to rise up together recognizing until there is justice for all, there ain't justice at all. And so we are all to fix the broken politics, the broken systems, and when we preach Jesus, yes. Jesus is the one, I love it, who upgrades us. Jesus yeah. is the one whose tragic murder yeah, has set yeah, the stage yeah. for a transformational movement. And the vision of what took place back then should order our steps for what we ought to look like right now. He died for me. He died for you. That means I ought to see what is it the Imago Dei stamped on you. And yeah. you ought to yeah. see it stamped yeah. on me. Yeah. And once we do that, we discover since the image of God is stamped on all of us. I'm about to shout it means that all of us are persons of value. All of us are persons that God loves and cares for. And when I see that in you, I want to treat you that way. And then fight to correct unjust systems that discriminate against anyone because of how God made them. I'll see if I can if I can wrap this up. I, I have the privilege of uh, preaching in Cape Town, South Africa in September. And so uh, the IC3 conference led by uh, my classmate, uh, profound preacher, Dr. Yes. Ralph Douglas West, was held in uh, South Africa, in Cape Town, and the hotel we stayed at was the one and only. The one and only. That's a hot place. The one and only. And please, don't hate, celebrate. One day you'll participate. So, <laughs> so here it is. We stayed at the one and only hotel. It's a hot hotel. The one and only. And when I checked in, I'm blown <laughs> away uh, by the matchless beauty of the one and only. Even the lobby is eye massaging in its beauty. I mean, the one and only is artistically beautiful. Beautiful. It's architecturally well laid out. And so here's what happened. I check in to the one and only, and this is what happened. I check in. They give me a nice room. I got me a nice room. My room, watch, watch this, has a view of some water that is just outside of the window. Mm -hmm. It is a mm -hmm. magnificent sight right there. And so the thing that I'm jacked, though, with is the fact that it is September. That means it is winter in South Africa. I'm coming from summer in Dallas to winter in South Africa. So it's a little chilly and so we go out for the evening worship, come back that evening and my room is cold. Now that upset me because I'd already set the temperature on the thermostat to 72 and so surely it's going to feel like 72 but when I get back in the room it ain't 72. I look at the thermometer on the thermostat and it says 60 degrees. We ain't going to make it through the night with 60 degrees. My, 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 my I, I can't roll like that. And so, so with that being the case, I turned the thermostat up to 78, hoping that heat would rush through the vent. It did not. Cold air came through the vent, and that made me call downstairs because you're not going to stay at the one and only a five-star hotel in Cape Town, South Africa, mm -hmm. and freeze to death. Right. Here's what's right. jacked right. up. I started sneezing at that moment, right. and when I sneezed, I knew I was in bad shape. I called down to the front desk. They sent the maintenance 
person up and here's what happened. The maintenance person said, well, I'm sorry, I checked out what's happening here in the structure. Something is wrong. And as a consequence, there's a disconnect between the heating system and the thermostat. So there's a disconnect in the system because of the structure. The structure's a little off right here. And so we're going to have to uh, do something different to keep you comfortable. And so we're going downstairs and I'm going to get you some space heaters as well as some extra blankets. I said, no, that ain't going to work. That's charity, not justice. Come on. Catch that in just a moment. <laughs> charity <laughs> is bringing me space heaters in a system that is broken. And I'm like, no, I ain't staying in the one and only with all of these space heaters because a fire may break out mm -hmm. and I will, in the name of your good charity, end up in a worse predicament. And yeah. so he said, well, I see what you're saying. Here's what you do. Call down to the front desk because the one who runs the property is working the night shift. And so you call down to the front desk. Here's his name. Ask for him by name. Once you ask for him by name, yeah. then tell Come him on, your God. predicament and I tell you he will take care of Come it. So that's what I did. I called down to the front desk. I asked for the one who runs the property by name. Called him by name. And once I called him by name, they then put him on the phone. I said, sir, I've been told that you are the one who's working the night shift. You run the property. I've asked for you by name according to the maintenance director's, the maintenance director's directions. And I have a broken system here and they're trying to fix it, but they can't fix it, so they're sending me space heaters and blankets, and that's not safe. He said, you're right. That's not how we operate at this five-star hotel, the one and only. And because we don't operate like that, we're going to upgrade you. As a matter of fact, Come we've down. discovered Make everyone on Make that floor, I'm about to shout you, everyone on that floor is having the same issue, and so what we're going to do, we're going to upgrade you as well as those who have been on yeah, that floor, yeah, and yeah. you're going to a, 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 a to, to the floor on the top. You've been on the bottom floor, but you're about to go to the floor on the top. I yeah, said, well, that's yeah, yeah. Let me go ahead and pack the bags. He said, no, don't worry about your bags because my son is doing his internship with me. So I'm going to send my son to your home. He's going to have his own bag. And once I send my son to your home, and she's going to carry your bags to the room where you're supposed to be Come on, because the structure is messed up. The system is broken. But I'm sending my son, since you called for me by name, I'm sending my son, and my son is going to upgrade you. Well, I hope y'all got that by now, and that is please understand it. I know that we live in an unjust world, but I hope somebody at Perkins will say, I'm going to live out my ministry calling on the Father by name. Because if you call on him by name, I guess y'all don't know his name. If you call on him by name, my ancestor said he's a hard fixer and a mind regulator. A burden bearer and a heavy load sharer. If you call on him by name, I promise you he's already sent his son. And his son has said, I'm going to handle your baggage. Wounded for our transgression. Bruised for our anointing. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And because the Son has come for our baggage, the good news is we shall overcome. And when we overcome, that means we will live out the vision that God has for God's humanity to be a family as opposed to one that is divided and crazy. And that is going to happen because not only are we going to overcome. I guess I got to update this since y'all didn't get that and go with Kendrick Lamar because Kendrick Lamar said don't trip. All's my life I had to fight. But if God's got us, we then going to be alright. Yes sir.
for that empowering uh, just I don't even know what to say. <laughs> Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. If you all will stand with me and join us in the Negro National Anthem. peace. Go now in the power of God's Holy Spirit, preaching Jesus in this unjust world. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes, I do. <laughs> come on, come on. 